So, in chapter 4 here, <clears throat> this is the story of Cain and Abel. So this is a very famous passage, and actually some very famous things that are said throughout the whole world. And it, what's interesting, I could probably do a whole sermon on just different sayings that the world uses that are from the Bible. And you think of, you're saved by the skin of your teeth, Job. You think of this, am I my brother's keeper? People say this all the time. I mean, and it's funny because there, all this stuff is coming out of the Bible. Sin life at the door, um, you know, uh, scapegoat, like all that stuff. Even, even stuff from Leviticus people are using, you know, as, as phrases. And so there's all kinds of, of phrases that the Bible talks about or that, 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 that's the author of it. And so that shows you the power of God's word, first of all, of all that stuff. So that's not, that's not in my notes. But I just, you know, as I'm reading through Genesis, you just see all these phrases and stuff. And it's like everybody uses this stuff. And even atheists, you know, will use these, these phrases. And it's funny because it's like, it's like they can't get away from it. And you know what? They can change the fact that, uh, change our dates to be BCE and, uh, and you know, uh, CE, which... You know, our, we would say before Christ and, and A.D., which, Ado Domini, which means in the year of our Lord. They, they say it's before Common Era and Common Era. But you know what? What else happened at that time? <laughs> you know, so they can try to change that stuff all they want. So anyway, uh, Genesis 4, starting there in verse 1, it says, Adam knew Eve, his wife. Now, this shows us what that term to know your wife. So as a man knows his wife, uh, you know, it's talking about, you know, what married people do in order to have children. And so, um, when you go to Genesis 19, you know, we've already preached on that, I'm not preaching on that tonight. That's how you can define terms. This is the first time it kind of, it mentions this, obviously, because the first person that's ever been born is Cain and Abel. So, Adam and Eve, Adam came from the dust of the earth, Eve came from, uh, from his rib, and Cain and Abel were the first ones born. And so, you know, this is definitely a significant event. Now, it's interesting. Now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not dogmatic on this, but it is interesting that it says she conceived and only once, but then she bare twice. So, it could be speculated that Cain and Abel are twins. And so, it wouldn't be out of the ordinary. There's definitely twins in the Bible like Jacob and Esau, like, uh, like Zerah and Perez of Judah, of Tamar. And so, we definitely see twins a lot in the Bible. And definitely those that are going against each other. Definitely with Jacob and Esau, you see that, where they're going against each other. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. You see that dichotomy with them. But, uh, but here, either way, Cain is the eldest. Even if he is a twin, he's still the eldest. Okay? So Cain was first born, then Abel. And notice Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. So Cain, or Abel was a shepherd, and Cain was a farmer, so to speak. Now, right from the beginning, there's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with, with Abel being a shepherd and Cain being a tiller of the ground. Those are, those are both occupations in the Bible. I mean, that's something that is brought up time after time, the, that you'd bring in the, the, good, the firstlings of your flock and that you'd also tie the, 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 what you brought in from the field. And so there's nothing wrong with these occupations. So it's not like Cain had some wicked occupation of like tilling the ground, okay? Because obviously that's what Adam had to do. You know, he had to, by the sweat of his face, according to Genesis chapter 3. So it's not the occupation. It's not, that's not what the issue that comes up here with the offerings that are brought. So in Genesis 4 and verse 3, though, we notice that now they're going to bring an offering unto the Lord, and this is where things get, get ugly, so to speak, or this is where it starts going downhill. And so it says, In process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and, his offer, and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. So we see here, that they brought offerings, but they brought two different types of offerings. And so this is, this is really, honestly, the best picture of salvation by faith and salvation by works. Salvation by blood and salvation by good deeds or the product of good deeds. And so this is something that with Cain, Cain, you know, you could think the offering of fruits is, is, is you know, the offering of something that... You, the fruit of the ground, the, 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 the fruit of your labor, so to speak. And so 
that is a picture, you know, when you think of Cain and you think of Abel, you see one is, is picturing the blood sacrifice, one's picturing something by works, okay? And so in Jude, Jude in verse 11, there's, Cain is actually brought up when it's talking about false prophets. We're going to see that Cain was actually a child of the devil, okay? And so this is something that, that is brought up in the New Testament as well. But in Jude, in verse 11, it says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. So it talks about this way of Cain. So I believe the way of Cain is the way of salvation through works. Or, you know, this is, the way of Cain is literally every other way to heaven besides the true way. That's what I believe. I believe that's everybody, every other religion is trying to go the way of Cain, which is to bring in the fruit of their labor for an offering. And that's supposed to suffice. But notice, God did not respect that offering. And every religion that brings in their work offering to the Lord for salvation is not going to cut it. Now, obviously, this offering wasn't... Abel did not need to bring this offering in order to get saved. But it does picture something. And that's all these sacrifices from, from this sacrifice here until you, until you get the sacrifice of Christ. It's, you know, it's all a picture until you get the Christ. It's all a picture of what Christ was going to do. And so we see that this is the way of Cain. The way of Cain is to bring the fruit of your labor. And so, uh, in, in Hebrews, go to, go to Philippians chapter 1. I just want to show you some places. I, and I'll probably do a whole sermon on fruits because that's something that's misconstrued. And there's definitely a lot of false doctrines when it, when it, when it comes to fruits and what that's talking about. But fruit just means the product of something what it produces. And that can be in, in a lot of different ways. Obviously, if you're talking about a tree, it's producing some kind of, you know, thing that you eat, you know. But think about when you go to a produce stand. What are you, what are you planning on finding? Fruits and vegetables, right? That, that the plants or the trees brought forth. And so, fruit isn't necessarily the work. Fruit is the product of the work. Right? So when he brought up this, all his veg, whatever he tilled out of the ground, it doesn't really say, it just says the fruit of the, the ground. When he brought that to them, that's the product of what he worked to get. Okay? And so that's a whole sermon in itself. But you're in Philippians chapter 1, but in Hebrews chapter 6, it says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Notice the difference. Those are the two sides. Doing works to get to heaven and believing on Christ to get to heaven. And notice the dead works, meaning that that's not going to save you. Okay, those works are, are, are worthless. They're not profitable. And so, but in Philippians chapter 1, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But in verse 22, it says, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my what? Labor. Yet what I shall choose, I want not. So he's making a point there that the fruit of his labor, you always find fruit in dealing with something you labor. Think of the fruit of the womb. Well, your wife has to go through labor in order to bring forth that fruit. Okay, that's not something that you would not call that gr a grace period there, you know. I don't think anybody, any woman would say that that's like something that you didn't have to work for in order to, you know, to, to have that child. And so you go through labor, travail, and pain in order to bring forth a child, to bring forth that fruit into, into the earth. And just as much as, you know, a tiller of the ground has to labor. And so, you know, my, my brother actually does a lot of gardening. And it's hard work, you know, until you get a tractor. You know, <laughs> but it's still hard work even if you have a tractor to do a lot of the work, you know, for you. It's still a lot of work to do all that type of stuff, to till it, to keep it up. And all that stuff, it's a lot of work. So this is really showing the two sides of how, how people try to get to heaven. And really, you can link everybody into the way of Cain besides the way through Christ, which is by faith. And so the way of Cain, they've gone in the way of Cain, which is by works. Really, when you pin any of these religions down, it comes down to that they, they think you have to do good works to go to heaven. Some kind of work. It's always going to come out. But go to Psalm chapter 104. I just really want to... Put this, you know, put this in there. The fruit of thy works. The fruit of thy labor. So fruit and works don't equal each other. Does that make sense? Because people say, well, you know, you'll know you're, that Christian by their fruits, therefore you're going to see good works. Wrong. That doesn't make any sense. Because if you're going to know them by their fruits, that's the product of them. That's the product of what they've done, so to speak. 
So it doesn't make sense to say, well, you're going to know them by their fruits, therefore they're going to have good works. No, that doesn't make sense. What their works produce, maybe, would be fruit, okay? But that's a whole other sermon for itself. But in Psalm 104 and verse 13, it says, Psalm 104 and verse 13, it says, He watereth the hills from his chambers, the earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy works. So it wouldn't make sense to say the work of thy works, okay? That, I just want you to see that fruit just means the product of something. So Cain brought forth something from his works that he did. In order to get that fruit there to be an offering, he had to do work to get it there. Okay, and so uh, we're not saved by works. And obviously, I'm talking, I'm, pre I'm preaching to the choir when it comes to this. But in uh, in in Romans three, what's interesting in Romans three, it gives this, you know, that we're not saved by works, but we're saved by faith in His blood. And so we'll see that in, in Romans three. But in Romans three, in verse twenty. It says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. I'll, I'll just read Galatians, Galatians 3.10. It says, for, for as many as are, as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. So we know this to be true from Genesis to Revelation, that it's not by works, that it's by faith, and so we see this from the very beginning here. We see this, this picture of someone trying to, go to trying to get, get saved or have the respect of God, so to speak, by their works, and one trying to do it by the blood. Okay? And so there's, there's two ways, either by blood or by, by your works. And so uh, now this blood of the firstlings of the flocks that, that, that Abel brought in, that didn't save him. That blood of that, that animal, the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sins. But it is a picture. Like this offering that's being done, it is a picture of what salvation is. And so all these offerings that are done throughout the Old Testament within the Levitical priesthood, they all picture something of some aspect that Jesus was going to do. So, uh, but, in, but in Hebrews, go to Hebrews chapter 11. I want to show you some things in Hebrews dealing with Abel, actually. Cain and Abel. So the New Testament brings this up, and also, you know, this also validates that this, this is a true story. This isn't something that's just made up. This isn't just fairy tales. And when we're in Genesis, that's something that is attacked. It's attacked and saying these are just fables, you know, and, and, and all this stuff in the Old Testament that it's just a story. No, it's not real. You know, none of that happened. It's all just supposed to... No, these things are brought up in the New Testament. These are actual people, and it just validates that these stories are actual stories that are true. So in, in Hebrews 11, this is the hall of faith. And the first person it starts with is with Abel. And so we get a little more information about this, the, what was going on with the sacrifice or this offering that was here. But Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4, it says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. So it's interesting, and when you go through Hebrews 11, it's by faith, by faith, by faith. It's going through all the different people up to, you know, we're going up to, you know, Samson, Jephthah, and he, he basically saying, you know, I, you know he, he can go on and on about those people, the people that did things by faith and that were saved and obtained a good report. But Abel here, by faith, offered this. So he was already saved when he offered this offering. But he, he, he offered this offering, and it was a picture of what he was putting his faith in, which is in the blood of Christ. And so, but when it says at the end here, by it he being dead yet speaketh, it's just showing that eternal life that's there, right? And I believe that by it, meaning, I don't believe it's talking about the offering, I believe it's talking about his faith. Because it starts off saying, by faith Abel did this, and by it he being dead yet speaketh, because right before that, in chapter 11, it's talking about how the elders obtained a good report by faith. And so, this whole chapter is talking about the fact that they, they saw the promises afar off, but they didn't receive the promises. So, they, they, they searched for, you know, they looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. So, uh, but, so with, with Abel, it was his faith that saved him, just like Abraham, just like anybody, that by faith they would be saved. But it's the blood that saves. 
And so this picture of Abel with the sacrifice, with the blood of the animal, is picturing what Christ was going to do. Go to Hebrews chapter 9. So go back a couple chapters. Hebrews chapter 9. And there's so many verses on this in Hebrews 9 and all this stuff. I'm not going through them all. I just want you to see one. In Hebrews 9 and verse 22, Hebrews 9 and verse 22, it says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. There is no remission of your sins without the shedding of blood. Now, Hebrews is really keying in on the Old Testament and the New Testament that it says that the Old Testament was dedicated. It wasn't dedicated without blood. It's saying that that was dedicated with blood. When Moses, when he dedicated, he sprinkled blood on all, all the stuff of the sanctuary. He sprinkled blood on the book, you know, of the he, he sprinkled blood on everything and on the people themselves. And so it was all sanctified by blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. And so the same thing, you know, when it comes to the New Testament, although the blood of Christ is what saved everybody from the foundation of the world to the end of the world. The stuff in the Old Testament was just a picture of it. But his blood is what saves us. It's what saved Abel. is the blood of the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. And so, go to Hebrews chapter 12. But actually, Abel's brought up again. So I'm going to read a little bit here. Hebrews chapter 12. It's showing us the difference between the covenant that was given on the Mount Sinai and the New Testament dealing with Christ, the New Covenant. But it says, it says, For ye are not come unto the mount that... Or I'm sorry, in verse 18. I should probably give you a starting point there. Verse 18. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness, and darkness, and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they, they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded, and if so much as a beast touched the mountain... It shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the great general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So it's interesting, it comes full circle. And it's talking about the Old Testament in particular, but it's going all the way back to Abel and his, his offering. Notice that in Hebrews 11 it says that he offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And so that offering was a great offering. You know, and it, sh it showed the picture of Christ. But it's saying that the, the blood of Christ speaketh better things than that of Abel. Okay? And so... That's, that's giving Abel's sacrifice quite high calling there. So it's going full circle saying Abel's sacrifice, the Old Testament sacrifice was with blood, and Jesus' blood is it's speaking better things than that. And the blood is sprinkling it. In 1 Peter, I don't have it written down, but it says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so an obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so it talks about that. You know, Jesus went up to the, to the holy, holiest of all, he, it, the, into the temple made without hands, and he entered in there not with the blood of others, but with his own blood. And so that's what Jesus did, and it was with his blood. And so uh, go to 1 Peter chapter 1, and we'll see this. But in, in Revelation 13, it talks about uh, the... The lamb, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, talking about the beast, whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So Christ, I'm not, I'm not here to preach about the everlasting gospel, but Christ, Christ's blood was, was applied to Abel. Christ's blood that he shed in the future was applied to Abel. And that's why he being dead yet speaketh. Because, and Abel was in heaven. I believe Abel was in heaven, and that's why God knew. I mean, obviously God knew that Cain slew his brother. And he's asking him this question. It's not like he didn't know what happened. And he said, his blood crieth out from the ground. But, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, notice what it says here. And it's interesting because it, it really goes into uh, the fact of 
the, the, the blood of sprinkling of Christ speaketh better things than that of Abel. For as much, in verse 18, it says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. So all that stuff, you know, in the Old Testament, all the way back to Abel, that's not what redeems you. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. So we see here that the blood of Christ is what redeems us. And he was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. So Abel, I just want you to show, Abel, he had faith in Christ. Moses had faith in Christ. Abraham had faith in Christ. Adam had faith in Christ. Everybody that ever went to heaven had faith in Christ. Because that Christ that was to come was promised to, to Adam and Eve when they fell. And so that's what was preached. That's what was believed on. And yes, they didn't know exactly how Christ was going to, what he, exactly he was going to do. And we don't know exactly what they knew back then or what exactly they knew. But... But all we do know is that they believed that the Christ was going to come and he was going to die and pay for their sins and it, it, somehow, right? Amen. And I believe throughout history we got a little more information, a little more information. And I believe they knew that God was a, a, you know, a triune being, you know, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, but maybe that wasn't exactly explicitly explained as much as the New Testament. So a lot of stuff wasn't revealed and it's more revealed in the New Testament, obviously. But in 2 Timothy, did I say 2 Timothy? So 2 Timothy... In chapter 1 and verse 9, notice what it says, Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and had brought life and immortality to the light through the gospel. So we see here that, that obviously he's before ordained, the, the, the eternal life was promised before the foundation of the world. Christ, he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He was foreordained, but he was manifest in these last times, but it was as if God had done it. He speaketh of those things which be not as though they were. That's right. So that's something that's very clear in the Bible. So these dispensationalists can go take a hike. But in Romans chapter 3, we, we were talking about how you know, we're, we're not saved by works and not by the deeds of the law, and so, but it's interesting because it, it goes from that and then it goes into what we are saved by. In Romans 3, very famous passage, Romans 3.23, I, I use this out so wanting all the time. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His, what? Blood. To declare His righteousness for the remission of sins, that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and to justify of him which believeth in Jesus. So we see that this is, this is from the foundation of the world, that they're saved by the blood. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Right? We sing all these songs, nothing but the blood. That's been true from the foundation of the world. Right. That they're saved by the blood. And so... The, the sacrifices, the sacrifices of Abel, why did God respect it? Because that was the true sacrifice that, you know, it represented the true sacrifice that was going to be made. The, the, the fruit of the ground did not represent that. It represented a, a salvation by works, by labor. And it's not by works, it's by faith in His blood. And so that's been true from the foundation of the world. And it's, it's awesome to see how the Bible all fits together and how it brings it full circle. There's no coincidence that they went back to Abel to, to show you this. That, that Abel and Cain and, and the way of Cain compared to Abel's offering that God respected and the blood, the sprinkling of blood that speaketh better things than that of Abel. And so it comes full circle showing from the very beginning it's always been by the blood. And so uh, that's interesting. It's interesting to see that uh, as far as what Cain's occupation, what he should have done is bought a, a, a lamb or, you know, an offering. He should have bought, you know, sold his goods, you know, that his fruit or whatever, and bought a sacrifice in order to sacrifice an offering. That would have been legitimate. And God would have respected that. 
And so that, just because, it, it'd be like me, you know, just think about those times back there. Everybody had different occupations, so you're supposed to bring up every little thing that you do, you know, what you do as an occupation. No, everybody, if they wanted to, to keep the Passover, they had to have a lamb, <laughs> okay? There was certain, it was a specific way it had to be done. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's only one way. He is the way. That is the way, and you can't, just because you have, it just happened to be that Abel was a shepherd, okay? It just happened to be that way. So he didn't have to buy one. He just took it of his own flock and gave that offering. And so that Cain should have bought something off of his brother Abel in order to give an offering. And so, uh, but, but anyway, what's interesting is what, he, what, what God says to, to Cain in verse 7. So go back to Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7. So I don't believe necessarily he was reprobate at this point. Because we will see that he was of the wicked one. So we'll see that he is a child of the devil because it gives that dichotomy we'll see in, in the New Testament of Abel being righteous and Cain being of the wicked one. So we'll see that that's a picture of that in, in the very beginning here. But I don't believe that you know when he did this, did this offering, I don't believe that he was past hope here. Because God's reasoning with him here. And so I believe after this, though, is when he decides to darken his own heart. But in verse 7 there, it says, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? So God's saying, you'll be accepted if you do well. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. What's he saying? He's saying, because Cain is the eldest. He's, he is saying that if you do well, Abel, his, uh, shall, uh, he'll, you'll be his desire, and you'll rule over him. He's promising that to Cain. So what did Cain do? He threw it all away. And so he threw it all away. He was mad because God didn't respect his offering. And he threw it all away. And so he had an inheritance. He, he was the eldest. He was going to receive the inheritance. But he threw it all away and killed his brother. And so and it was all because you know he wanted to go that way. That's how he wanted to do it. He didn't care that that's not what God wanted. And so when you think of, uh, you think of people that are turned over to a reprobate mind, they have their way. They're stubborn in their head. They want to do it this way. And God's being, he's wanting to reason with them. It's not like he's you know, just casting them off after he gave that offering. So that's interesting to me. Uh, you know, the fact that well, you may read over that. But God is saying, hey, if you do well, then... He'll desire you, and, he'll, and you'll rule over him. So it's very interesting that he gives that. But, next verse, he throws it all away. And so in verse 8, it says, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. This reminds me of Joab and how he killed uh, Abner. So if you remember the story with Joab, Joab was the... Um, I'm always getting them mixed up. He's a nephew, but it's his sister's sons. So Joab, Asahel, and Abishai are his sister's sons. But Joab was the captain of the host, and Abner came in. He wanted to make a league with David because he was done fighting. You know, he wanted to just combine the kingdoms and all that stuff. So he came for peace, but Abner killed Asahel, his brother. So he wanted him dead from that day since he killed his brother. And so he went up to him and he spoke with him. He took him aside to speak with him and then he, he stabbed him underneath the fifth rib. So it's interesting because it's just like this sly, like murder, you know. It's not like he just said, let's, let's do this, you know. And they went, they went to the octagon, so to speak, and let's fight this thing out. No, <laughs> I don't believe that's the way it happened. I believe he killed him in a sneaky way. So it says he talked with them. And then when they were in the field, he slew him. So that, that, that's interesting because that's something you see throughout the Bible, how, how people sneakily do that. And obviously David condemned that. You know, he, he condemned the fact that, that he killed him. So this is just cold-blooded murder that he does uh, and when he kills Abel. So the Lord comes and now and it says, it says, The Lord said unto Cain in verse 9, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. So God knew what happened, 
but he's asking him this question to see what, what Cain's going to say. So he gives that smart out. It's almost like a smart out. Am I my brother's keeper? And so, no remorse. There's no remorse. The only time he has remorse is when there's a punishment. And that's what you'll find with reprobates or, or people that are children of the devil. They don't have remorse. Do you think, uh, I think Pastor Roger Jimenez is doing a whole documentary on psychopath rep reprobates. Just dealing with psychopaths in general. The, the idea of a psychopath or a sociopath is the fact that they have no uh, conscience. Like, what they do doesn't, like, it doesn't register with them. They don't think that, it's, that it would hurt. Like, it doesn't, you know, hurting somebody, killing somebody, it, no emotion. And so, uh, it's interesting because he gives that smart aleck remark, so to speak, but it's not until God pronounces his punishment to where he's like, oh no. And so, that's, that's what's interesting about it. But, uh, go to 1 John chapter 3. So Cain and Abel are brought up again uh, in, in 1 John chapter 3. And this is where, because at this point, there's nothing really to say that Cain was a reprobate or that he was a child of the devil. Besides maybe if you were to link Jude, where I showed you in Jude cha uh, verse 11 there, where it says that they've gone the way of Cain. So you're in the hall of reprobates. <laughs> you're in the false prophet chapter. You're probably, it says they're clouds without water. I mean, that would link him into that, first of all, anyway, that he's one of those guys. But uh, in, in 1 John 3, it really seals the deal with that. So 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10, notice what it says. It says, in this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. So it's giving two sides here, the children of God and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. What's interesting about this, so we see that he's called the child, uh, he was of the wicked one. And so, and it says that this is the difference between the children of God and the children of the devil. So we see that Abel is the ch child of God, Cain is the child of the devil. But what's interesting about this is why did he kill him? Why did he kill him? Because he was righteous. Because he was a good guy. Because he was doing right. And isn't that interesting? Because that's what you see in the world today, is that people hate you because you're doing what's right. They just hate you because you, you have a family that's a good family, you're taking care of them, you're, you're, you haven't divorced your, your spouse, you're, you're, you know, you're trying to do right, you're going to church, you're, 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 you don't curse, you dress appropriately, like all these things that they just, they just hate that. They hate the fact, you know why? Because it makes them look bad. That's why. Because it just shines a light on their sin and they don't like light. You know, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And so, why did, why did he kill Abel? Because his brother's deeds were righteous and his were evil. And so, that's a very interesting point because that's something, that's why I saying, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. Because they hate things that, people that do right. And this isn't just, I don't believe this is just reprobates here, okay? Because I believe unsaved people can do this, and I believe saved people can even hate you. Now, obviously, it's saying here, that if you hate your brother, you're in sin. Okay? It says, Whoso hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. And it's talking about Christ abiding in you. It's not talking about the fact that you're losing your salvation. That's a whole other sermon. I'll have to go through 1 John eventually. But all I'm saying with that is that that is something that happens all across the board. So, reprobates definitely hate you because you're good, because you're a Christian. They just hate you for that. But unsaved people, the world in general, is not going to like you because you're doing right and they have a bunch of sin. They know it, you know, but they don't want to admit it. And so you're making them look bad. And so, and then Christians are the same way. Backslidden Christians that are walking in the old man that aren't doing what they should be doing. Have you, I'm sure you've seen this in churches where you're going out soul winning, you're getting on fire, you're reading your Bibles, and all of a sudden someone comes up and puts a wet blanket on it. Oh, are they really getting saved? I didn't see him coming to church. You know, why did they do that? Because deep down they know they should be doing it. And so therefore they have to try to put you down in order to make themselves feel better. 
And isn't that the case in, in a lot of in times that you're dealing with people? It, you, you run into those people that are constantly putting you down to make themselves feel better. So don't be that person, okay? Never be that person to, to put someone down to, to lift yourself up because you look like a fool, first of all. Most people, if you it, will see through that, as soon as you start putting someone down, they can see that, that foolishness and that you're trying to lift yourself up. Let another man's lips praise you, not your own. And so, but this is an interesting story and it really shows a lot more information. Why did Cain kill Abel? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. That's why. Because he brought the right sacrifice. God had respect unto his and not, to, had respect unto Abel's and not his own. And therefore he killed him because he did right. And so you wouldn't think that. You would think that it was something else. But it really was just because, because Abel was a righteous man. And he hated that. And he killed him for it. And so, interesting dichotomy there. But it's also just interesting that it's across the board. I've seen this in churches all the time where people just feel bad because they're not doing what they should be doing. Therefore, they take it out on the people that are doing right. And don't ever let that be said about you. If you ever get backslidden, because we're all human. None of us are, are... It says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand to take heed lest he fall. There is no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. And therefore, we're all susceptible to that. So if you ever get backslidden, don't ever turn around and start taking it out on people that are doing right. You just need to take it. Okay, you just need to take it. And you know, this happens when you hear hard preaching and you get someone up there slamming the pulpit saying, you know, you need to get this right, you need to do this, you need to start doing this, you need to stop doing that. And they take it out on the preacher. They start hating on the preacher. They start hating on people that are doing right to make themselves feel better. And so don't ever be guilty of that. So, I don't, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not in the extreme of reprobates here. We're, we're just talking in general in church. I'm talking about Christians here that need to, to not hate your brother. It's never right to hate your brother. There is a time to hate. Never hate your brother or sister in Christ. The Bible is very clear on that. That is never acceptable. You're never to be angry with your brother without a cause. And if you do, you've committed murder already in your heart. See how that works together where it says he that, committed, he that hated his brother is a murderer. Hating your brother without a cause. Or, or being angry with your brother without a cause. It's not wrong to be angry with your brother if it's for a righteous reason. Okay, so, But, you know, that's that's... It definitely closely links these things together. It talks about, even when you're dealing with reprobates, it says, don't be like them. Okay? You know, the, it's, it's a shame to speak of those things which they do in private. But don't do anything that they do. Okay? So, anyway. Uh, so, the children of God versus the children of the devil. Now, this is interesting. The fact that, it, that Abel was, was a child of God, but Cain was a child of the devil... Because it really helps us understand something. Go to Matthew chapter 23. And this verse kind of, this, this, chat, this passage kind of always perplexed me as far as how this would be true. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain how this is true just by looking at Cain and Abel in general. So Matthew 23, you know, this is the, this is the sermon that Jesus is just throwing down on the scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Blind guides, vipers, generation of vipers. I mean, he's just ripping face on these guys. But at the end here, in verse 34, I want you to see this particularly. Verse 34. So Matthew 23, and verse 34. It says, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, the son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Now, what's interesting about this, now, obviously, we know that Jerusalem killed the prophets. I mean, you can see that through the Old Testament. They killed Jesus. They killed John the Baptist. Like, all these things, you can definitely see that. But Abel, how are they guilty of Abel's blood? Because Abel is way before Israel, way before Abraham. I mean, this is at the foundation of the world, pretty much. How would they be guilty or that, that, the, that that blood would be upon them? Well, if you understand the fact that who's he talking to? He's talking to people that he called children of the devil. Right? He says, you are of your father the devil. 
So the group of people, the scribes and the Pharisees, the white sepulchers, those that could not believe, that he says in other places, the ones that are blinded according to Isaiah 6, that were blinded and, and, and reprobate, that have, that have blasphemed the Holy Ghost, well, you can see that he, they're in that family that has slain Abel, right? Because they are in the seed of the devil. They are the seed of Satan, or the devil, or the wicked one. Therefore, you can see how the blood would be on their hands because Cain was of the wicked one. So, the devil's seed was from the very beginning with Cain. Cain, I believe, was that first seed, so to speak, or the child of the devil. And then throughout history, you see it. You'll see the sons of Belial coming up in the Old Testament. And then you'll see the children of the devil coming up in, in the New Testament. So it's all the same there. But, but com coming back to Genesis chapter 3, we saw this. What's interesting, too, is how this fits in order. Genesis 3, who was the battle between? The woman and the serpent. In chapter 4, who's the battle between? Her seed and thy seed. So even in the order that he says it, it's done that way in Genesis 3 and then in Genesis 4. And so we saw that when we went into Revelation 12. Remember, it's between the woman and the serpent. And then, then it was between the Antichrist and all the children of God, which the Antichrist was obviously the seed of Satan. Okay, so obviously he's, an, he's a devil. But, um, but in Genesis 3.15, notice it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now obviously, now this is talking about Christ in general, with you know, her seed with Christ. But that seed, remember, if you be in Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed. If you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. How do you become Abraham's seed? By believing on Christ. Therefore, Abel would have been a part of that seed. That's right. We're a part of that seed. Anybody that believes on Christ is part of that seed. So therefore, Abel would be her seed, part of that her seed, which is, which is in Christ. And then Cain would be the thy seed, which is the serpent's seed. So... It's interesting how that works out. When, so you see how uh, Matthew 23 makes sense? That the bloodshed from righteous Abel to Zacharias, the son of Berechias, would be upon them? Because he's talking not just about the Jews in general. He's talking about reprobate Jews. He's talking about people that were children of the devil. And so, but you see this too with Revelation 18. You don't have to turn there. But in Revelation 18, uh, when we're dealing with Babylon being destroyed... Well, one of the last things it says after it's being destroyed, it says in verse 24, it says, In her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. So it's interesting that it would say that and you say, well, it, it could be. Now, just to, just to be candid with you, it could just be talking about all that's slain upon the earth at that time. So it doesn't mean necessarily that this is talking about, but it does talk about the apostles rejoicing earlier on in that. And obviously, they, they're not going to be around physically when that stuff happens because it, Paul was the last apostle. So, anyway, interesting stuff to see that, to see from the very beginning the, the children of God against versus the children of the devil, how they've been battling since the very beginning. But Hebrews chapter 11, again, I, we already read this verse about Abel, but it says uh, in Genesis... Uh, uh, let me find my place here. Yeah, in verse 11, so Genesis 4 and verse 11, it says, And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. And so it says that the, the earth crieth out, in verse 10, it says, the blood, uh, the, That thy uh, brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. It says, so that's what it's saying, you know, he being, by it he being dead, yet speaketh. And so, uh, the blood crying out, the fact that Abel was still alive, he could still talk. Because, if you think about, in Revelation 6, the prophets that were under the altar crying, O oh Lord, how long, O oh Lord, wilt thou not avenge our blood? I don't know if Abel's going to be underneath it. I don't know if that's just talking about those people during the Great Tribulation that have been killed, or if that's from the foundation of the world. <laughs> okay, That could be. It could be from the foundation of the world, the blood of Abel all the way on, of these, these martyrs, these people that have been killed and murdered to where God's going to avenge their blood. 
And so, anyway, they, they, they cry out about this. So that could very well be the case. But now we get into Cain's punishment. So again, Cain's not really remorseful here until the punishment is put upon him. So Genesis chapter 4 and verse 11, it says, And now art thou cursed from the earth. Now there's so many aspects of this. We, we, we saw in 2 Peter 2, they're cursed children. If we go to Hebrews chapter 6, it talks about that which bringeth forth thorns and briars is cursed and, 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 it, is, and is to be burned. And so uh, that's another passage dealing with people that have fallen away, that those that have it's impossible for them to come onto the repentance. Um, so uh, we're not going to get into all that, um, you know, with, with, with the reprobate part of it. But notice what it says here, and what he, his pronounce, pronouncement is on this. It says, When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. So that was his occupation. So what he was doing for a living, he's cursing that ground. It's not going to bring forth fruit unto him. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Now, he's a little remorseful because he can't, he can't bear it. You know? And he notice what he says mostly here. He, he admits to the fact that he's going to be a fugitive and a vagabond. But notice at the end of verse 14, it says, And it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. So he's afraid, saying, hey, someone's going to kill me because I killed Abel. Now, what's interesting about this, too, is I believe that there was other people living at this time, too. So Adam and Eve had other children. And so it wasn't just Cain and Abel on the earth when this happened. Because we'll see that Cain is going to, you know, have children here after this. And so there was daughters before Seth was born and all this other stuff. So uh, obviously at the very beginning we talked about this, how everybody, Eve was the mother of all living. So, you know, they, their wives had to be sisters. So, obviously, today that would not work out the way the genetics work. And, uh, you know, in the Levitical priesthood, or in the Le Le Levitical law, they had restrictions. Anything, I think you could marry your cousin, but anything, after, anything closer than that it was off limits. And so, um, but nowadays I would not recommend marrying your cousin, your first cousin, that is. And so, um, especially if you're here in West Virginia, don't do that, okay? So... It's probably already being done in, our, in the lower part of the state. Anyway, so, uh, <laughs> so anyway, I do believe, though, that, that they have had children throughout this. So, uh, and so, therefore, that's why he's saying, if there was no one else, and it was just Cain, then why would he worry about someone killing him? If there's no one else there. And so there's other people there. There's other people being inhabited. And notice even when he brought forth that offering, it says, in process of time. So obviously, this didn't just happen, and, I, and they had to grow up too, so they weren't children when this happened, they were adult men. And so, in process of time, who knows how old they were when this happened. And so, we know that, that Adam was 130 years old when he had Seth, so we don't know when he got kicked out of the Garden of Eden, so obviously there's some time in there that can elapse, and people, and people having children, and getting older, and all that stuff. So, um, I believe there was definitely people around. Uh, but anyway, so God, instead of the death penalty, what's interesting about this passage is that there's no death penalty. I believe this is going to be the, one of the big reasons on why there was violence in the earth in those days. And why God ended up having to flood the earth because their thoughts were evil continually. I believe because what is the first thing he says to when they get off the ark? is dealing with the death penalty. We're going to look at that real quick. And I don't want to get too far into that because obviously we're going to be going through Genesis 9. But go to Numbers chapter 35. Numbers 35. So notice that the earth is cursed because of the blood of his brother Abel. This is a principle that's throughout the Bible, and this is still a principle today, that innocent blood pollutes the land. And so in Numbers 35 and verse 33. Numbers 35 and verse 33. So ye shall not pollute the land wherein ye are. For blood it defileth the land. And the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. So that's interesting. Now if you know this story, I don't have time to go through it, but this is a story in Numbers about someone was slain in a field and they don't know who did it. Okay, And so someone was, was murdered, 
they don't know who did it, so there was a law that they had as far as what they had to do. Like the whole town had to go out and they had to slay this animal and basically saying that they're innocent of this blood and all this stuff. So there was like this special thing they had to do for that. And so that's why he's going through this basically saying they need to be put to death, but obviously there's this case where they don't know who did it. So, you know, what do you do in that case? And so in order to cleanse the land so that God would bless them and wouldn't curse the land, they had to do a, a certain sacrifice. And so that's interesting that from the very beginning with Cain, when he killed Abel, that the land was cursed unto him. But in Genesis 9, in verse 5, it says, And surely your blood of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, and at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of, of man. And here's the famous verse in verse 6. So Genesis 9, verse 6. Whosoever sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. So right as soon as they get off the ark, now we have the death penalty. And this is the... This is what people will say, oh, thou shalt not kill. You shouldn't have the death penalty. No, this is what the Bible teaches. And when you understand the commandments, Jesus quoted as thou shalt not murder in one place. And so, yes, we can kill. The, the, God has given the authority to man to execute that judgment. That's where Romans 13 comes in, where he, he gives the authority, the powers that be, to execute judgment. That's what government's supposed to do. Right. And so that's where it comes into play. And obviously I believe this, this, this is one of the big reasons why God ended up having to destroy the earth because the death penalty wasn't being put out. Isn't that interesting that that's happening now where all these states are getting rid of the death penalty? And what does the end times talk about? We'll get into this when we get into, the, into the, actually where we get into Genesis 6 and the flood and all that stuff. But what was one of the things that, that, that God uses as an example before the end is it's going to be like the days of Noah. So it's interesting that that happens. So he puts a mark on him and he so he put a mark on him and this is not him becoming a black man. Okay. I didn't put anything down for this. It's just a stupid thing where they say the mark is meaning that he made him a black man. Okay. And so they do this with Cain, Cain, uh, uh, Canaan, uh, Ham's son as well where he was cursed and all this stuff. Listen, obviously, we all come from Adam and Eve. He's made of all nations of one blood, or one, one blood, all nations. And so, obviously, black people came out of that, you know, but I believe back then we were all, kind of, it was all brown, you know, and then you got, and, and, and honestly, if you, study, if you study out the fact of how people become black, it has to do with geography. It has to do with basically the sun and getting the, uh, you know, it just, if, you, if I lived in the Middle East, I would be really brown right now. Just because I would be out, you know, just in a different atmosphere. And so, um, I, I don't think I'd be black as the night necessarily. But genes, you lose things in genes and all that other stuff. And some people lost it, you know. Uh, anyway, I'm not, I'm not here to give a science lesson on, like, the, the pigment of your skin. But all I'm saying with that, nowhere in here does it say that he was black. You know, so, so this whole idea that Cain is Mark would made him a black man. That, that's all you know that goes back into is, is Mormonism, where, you know, the black people were, the people that are black were the people that were neutral in the fight between Jesus and Lucifer, and, and they're black because they didn't take a side and all this stuff. And, and so, anyway, they can take that racism garbage out somewhere else. The Mark, basically, if you think about it, he puts a mark on people like in, in the New Testament in Revelation so that they won't, you know, have the wrath being poured out upon them. So it could be something like that. I don't think it's necessarily just like that because this guy is a reprobate. This guy is a, a child of the devil, so he's not a saved person. But in Ezekiel, there's a place where God puts a mark on their forehead, you know, so that they wouldn't be punished and they wouldn't have, you know, they would be safe from harm. In Revelation uh, 7, with the 144,000, he puts them, his father's name in their forehead. He puts a mark on their forehead. But, you know, the Antichrist has a mark, too. So, all that to say is that you definitely see why he's putting a mark on him. It's kind of, he's, he's saving him from the judgment of men. And so, but it says that whosoever kills him, shall, uh, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold in verse 15. And so, that's interesting that that that's the case with this, but I think that is something that's going to cause problems, as the fact that the death penalty hasn't been instituted yet. Now, murder's always been wrong, 
But that's where the law comes in. The law was added because of transgressions. Notice that the law were things that were already known, but there wasn't punishments for a lot of those things. There wasn't basically meticulous things for stealing and for doing all these different things. Now, the death penalty for murder was there, but was the death penalty for adultery? Was the death penalty for homosexuality? Like all these things that the judgments weren't there, and that's where the, the law comes in. So you say, why did they add the law? Because of transgressions. Why did he add the death penalty? Because of transgressions, because that was, I believe, a major downfall to, to, the, to man, because without the death penalty, they didn't have much of a deterrent to, to commit all this violence. So, anyway, uh, so uh, I wanted to get into a little bit here. This is, uh, the main crux of the sermon was more about Cain and Abel, but Cain, in verse 16 there, he has some children, and I just want to, uh, you know, basically it goes down the list of some children he had, then they had children. But notice there's some uh, similar names like Enoch and Lamech. So you'll see Enoch, we think of Enoch, the seventh from Adam, that's not this one. So, and then uh, Lamech is the one that's going to be uh, doing this little prophecy or this little song or speech that he gives to his wives. That's not Moses. I mean, it's not Noah's dad. So Noah's dad is Lamech. So you'll see some similar names in here, but they're not the same. So when you see the city of Enoch, that's not talking about Enoch, the one that walked with God. So, uh, so in verse 16, it says, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nob on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. And so then it goes on, Enoch... It says, unto Enoch was born Irad, and then Irad begat Mahujael, and Mahujael begat Methusael, and Methusael begat Lamech. So now we're down to Lamech. And so Lamech, he has two wives. The one was Ada and the one is Zillah. So with Ada, he had Jabel and Jubal. The one was, they made tents. The other one uh, was good with music and handled the harp and organ. And then Zillah had Tubal Cain. Now, what's interesting about this, and you don't need to know this, but uh, there's, a, there's a wicked band out there called Tubal Cain. And so it's interesting because the devil, if you remember, he had all kinds of pipes and stuff like that when he was made. And we, well, I'm not going to go to Ezekiel 28 again right now. But basically, I believe he was very good with music. And you think of how music has a, a, a profound evil influence on the world. And so it's interesting that, that Cain's sons, or, you know, Cain's grandchildren, you know, down the line here, but ultimately his sons, you know, down the line, uh, both Jubal and Tubal Cain were very good with instruments, with the instructor of every tar uh, artificer in brass and iron. And so that's something interesting is that they're really into music. And so the children of the devil are really into music. And uh, that's something that, that the, the music industry, industry is very wicked. Very wicked. And they're out to get into the minds of your children. They're out to get into your minds. <laughs> okay? But they, the music has an attractive quality that is not just the words. It's what is being uh, played. It's the type of music that's being played. And what you have to understand that sometimes even music that doesn't have words to it can be very detrimental. And that's where CCM music comes in. I'm probably going to preach a whole sermon on that garbage music, the, the Christian contemporary music. Because, you know, the words could be okay, which that's, that's doubtful when it comes to them anyway. But the words could be okay, but if it's to horrible music, that's not good. Okay, if you have rock music or, or whatever... Um, and they've done studies on this with just people with conversations and they're listening to rock music compared to classical music and the types of conversations that you'll have, the types of thoughts that you'll have. And so music is a very big influence on our life, so we've got to have good music. And so, yes, you need to get the worldly music out of your lives, but you've got to replace it with good music. Okay, you can't just like, take that out. And I'm not against listening to the classical music. Yeah, I'm not saying you've got to be listening to, to God. Be the, you, you don't have to be singing. Like, obviously, if you're at work, they're going to, not, they're going to frown upon that. Okay? So, but it, you know, there's nothing wrong with listening to other music that's not necessarily uh, you know, hymns and stuff like that. I would, I would try to stick with that, 
you know, because you want to have that kind of music in your mind and in your heart to where you're singing that. Um, but it's the type of music, and you know what I'm talking about when it comes to classical type of music that's, that kind of you, you can think about stuff. I'm at work, and, and a lot of times I'll just listen to like a classical. I don't want any words because I'm working, so I don't want something like talking to me, so to speak, while I'm working. But when I'm working, I'm at a desk job, and so I'll have like a classical type of music playing, and it just helps me work. It just helps it flow. And you're not listening to, to the air and the, your ears ringing from silence, <laughs> okay? And so uh, music has a profound uh, influence on our lives, but make sure it's the right type of music. And so uh, the, don't worry. The children of the devil know what they're doing with music. They did. They knew how to work all the brass and, and the, you know, all this stuff. They know how to work it. And so uh, keep anything that's on TV... Anything that the Grammys put out or, you know, like all these different, uh, the, the, the mainstream stuff is garbage. Garbage. All it is is, I mean, I, I could show you songs and lyrics, and I preached a sermon on the Song of Fools one time, of just these songs and how blasphemous they are, and just the stuff they say. And it's, it's always against our Savior. It's always bad. And the stuff that tries to have God in it is worse than the rest. You know, that's why I hate country music. <laughs> okay, country music is like, it's like CCM, only it's mainstream, okay, because they're like, they basically talk about drinking beer, fornication, doing all this stuff, and, and you know, I'm not against them liking their dog, but, you know, they need to sing about something else every once in a while. But the, the thing is, is they, they mix that in, they're like, you know, this is where I drank my first beer, and this is where I met Jesus. It's like America, you know. No, it, it, that that is that is wicked to, to mix those things together. Okay, not meeting Jesus and drinking my first beer have nothing to do with each other. Okay, and so it's just I hate when you, you to mix those things together. And that's what country music does. That's what CCM music does. They're trying to mix the two things together, and they they don't mix. It's one or the other. Good music, bad music, and so. But anyway, I thought that was interesting with that. So. Um, one th last thing I wanted to get into was with Seth. So at the end of the chapter, end of the chapter, Seth is born. So in verse 25, we'll read the last two verses. So Genesis 4 and verse 25 it says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also, there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So, uh, we see here that it says, He hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel. Now, we know that other people have been born. Sons and daughters, I believe, have been born before this. Why is Seth that other seed? So, uh, go to Genesis chapter 5. So, just go over a chapter there in verse 3. I believe this is one point of it. In Genesis 5 and verse 3, it says, And Adam lived in 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. So I believe this is one of the big reasons why Seth was, basically he was to take that birthright, so to speak, or the genealogy. And uh, not the birthright necessarily. Birthright had to do with, you know, the goods that you were going to get. The genealogy applied to the seed of Christ's coming. And I'll maybe preach a sermon on the difference between that. So when you had, you had Esau and Jacob, uh, he sold his birthright, but then he stole the blessing. And, and even with, uh, with Jacob and his sons, he gave the blessing to Ephraim, but where was the genealogy counted from? Judah. So in First Chronicles, it talks about the difference between those two. Um, so that genealogy is going through Seth, and that's what I believe this is talking about where it says that they appointed me another seed instead of Abel. It's talking about the seed, meaning Christ, that Christ was going to come through this seed. And so um, that's where Seth comes in. So that when you look at the genealogy of Christ, Seth is the one that goes through. So um, a Abel would have been that seed, but he was killed. So, um, so Seth took his place in that, that aspect. Um, but, but Seth here... Ha, uh, has, an, has a son, and his name's Enos. Now, this last phrase here says, Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, there's definitely some... Uh, a lot of people say, well, 
uh, say, well, salvation's always been by calling upon the name of the Lord. Well, I agree with that. You know, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I believe that's been from the foundation of the world. But in here it says, then begin men to call upon the name of the Lord. So did people only get saved from when Enos was born? Because if that's the case, you know, Seth was 105 years when he had, when he had Enos. So that's 235 years, if you do the math, 235 years after the creation were people just getting saved at that point. We know that Abel was saved. So we know that's not true. So what, what you need to understand about the calling upon the name of the Lord is that it can apply physically and it can apply eternally. So it can it apply it in the spiritual matter of getting saved for, for, for eternal salvation, but you can also have physical salvation by calling upon the name of the Lord. And so you'll see that in the New Testament as well. But in the Old Testament, go to, go to Psalm 116. So I wanted you to see this. And I believe what's going on here, I believe when Enos was born, people called upon the name of the Lord because they were giving thanks unto God. I think there's a reason why it's saying, then began man to call upon him, Lord, because of Enos's birth. Something was significant about it, I believe, to where people were calling upon the name of the Lord. Not necessarily, and, and it could be, maybe, the fact that there was a big revival going on where people were getting saved, okay? But I don't believe that this is like when they started getting saved, because we know Abel's already saved. He's in the Hall of Faith. But go to Psalm uh, 116 and verse 13. It says, And I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. So we obviously see that it applies to eternal salvation, uh, you know, taking the cup of salvation. I will, in verse 14, I will pay my vows unto the Lord, now in the presence of all His people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. O Lord, truly, O, I am, I am thy servant, I am thy servant, and the son of thine handmaid, thou hast loosed my bonds. Notice what it says in verse 17. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving, and will call upon the name of the Lord. So, I believe that calling upon the name Lord, it can just be applying to praying and giving God thanks. In Hebrews, uh, Hebrews is very clear that Abraham believed before he went out. You know, by faith he went out from the country that he was called out of, in Hebrews 8, uh, 11, 8. But he built an altar when he got to a certain place, in Genesis chapter 12, and he built an altar and called upon the name of the Lord. I don't believe that that's when Abraham got saved. Because he calls upon the name of the Lord later on. So he's calling upon the name of the Lord multiple times after he'd already believed. And so uh, I believe that calling upon the name of the Lord is something that we're supposed to be doing continually. And even you would say if you needed God in a physical sense, you could call upon him for, the, for help. Right, and so uh, you can call on him for for Thanksgiving. You can call on him for e for eternal salvation. Obviously, that applies, but you can also call on him for other types of physical salvations. And so, uh, but but Genesis twelve and verse uh, eight, he's in he's in Bethel on the west and Hai on the east, and it says there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. In Genesis thirteen and verse three. It says, Abram, it says that he went back to that same place where he built an altar and he called upon the name of the Lord. In Genesis 21, in verse 33, so before he offers up Isaac on the altar, it says, Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. So I just want you to see that this is something I believe people call, can call upon the name of the Lord. It's not always talking about eternal salvation. I definitely believe it applies to eternal salvation. You know, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, and how shall they call on him in whom they not believe? So obviously that's a part, you know, where you're putting your trust in Christ and asking him for salvation. But in Hebrews 13, this is where we'll end, and we'll be done with this. I'm not 100% sure on exactly why it says, then begin men to call upon the name of the Lord. But I think it might have to do something with Enos. Right? Enos was born and something was going on to where people were starting to call upon the name of the Lord. So Enos was probably a, an important character. Maybe it was Seth. But maybe it was just, you know, you think of like a child is born and people just rejoicing and thanking God for it for some reason. Okay? And so Enos is maybe giving us a little insight that Enos was a, a great man of God or, or something like that, right? So I'm not 100% sure on that, but... I don't believe this is when people started getting saved. That's all I'm saying. Uh, but Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15, 
It says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such thank sacrifices, God is well pleased. So think, he built an altar and he called upon the name of the Lord. He sacrificed unto the Lord. And so I believe, God, I believe Abraham in those cases was giving thanks unto God. He was calling upon the Lord. He was sacrificing, giving thanks unto God. He wasn't getting saved all those times, right? And he didn't need to get saved more than once. And so uh, the calling on the name of the Lord, I definitely believe applies to eternal salvation. But I think, I think in Genesis 4, it could, be, it could either be dealing with something than the fact that people, a lot of people were getting saved at that point. Because when you go to Genesis 6, a lot of people were doing bad things, right? So maybe in this case with Enos, there's, there's a lot of people getting saved and calling upon the name of the Lord because of Enos. You know, I don't know. But, I don't, but it could just be the fact that people, when he was born, they were rejoicing and giving God thanks. And that's what it says in Psalm 116, that I will offer to thee the, thanks, the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. So it wouldn't be out of the ordinary according to scripture for that to be the case and so that's what I believe on that so uh, so that's Genesis 4 definitely interesting stuff with Cain and Abel uh, you know we got a lot more to get into when we get into uh, chapter 5 is going to be interesting just because it's, it's genealogies but this stuff's very important actually you can you can actually use this to date the earth you know because we're going back from Adam on and so we're gonna get some interesting stuff with that um, you know, with, with Enoch, uh, chapter 6 is a, okay, that's where people just pull out all kinds of false doctrines. So we're going to have fun with chapter 6. Um, but, uh, but just interesting stuff. And uh, Cain and Abel, wherefore slew his brother, because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. So marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. They hated me before they hated you. That's what Christ said. So uh, just remember that. It's been the same from the beginning. It's not different, <laughs> okay? And so let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this evening. I pray that you'd bless the, 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 the evening that we have together. And Lord, just pray that you'd give us safe travels. Thank you again for healing many in the church. And Lord, just pray that you continue to heal and to be with us. Be with us throughout the rest of the week as we go back to our jobs. And, and Lord, pray that you bless uh, the, the, everything that we do. And help us to bring glory to your name. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.